Warm welcome from us here in Singapore. My name is Clarice Yeo, and I am a second year medical student at the NUS Yong Lunin School of Medicine. We welcome you to COVID-19 Updates from Singapore, a series of 12 webinars presented by NUS Yong Lunin School of Medicine, National University Health System, and Global Outbreak Alert and Response Network. The COVID-19 Updates from Singapore weekly webinar series will provide viewpoints and insights from leading experts in infectious diseases and related specialties and disciplines. To introduce you to the rest of our panel of experts, it is my honor to welcome our program director, who will also be the moderator of today's update. Recruited to establish an infectious disease training program in Singapore, he became the first infectious diseases head of department in the Communicable Disease Centre in 1992. He is also a visiting senior fellow of the Courage Fund at the university. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. David Allen. Thank you, Clarice. Welcome again to our webinar, COVID-19 Updates from Singapore. I hope our broadcast, our broadcast finds you and your family as safe and well. We've selected thought leaders, acknowledged investigators, master clinicians, and policymakers to help uh, give their unique perspectives on COVID-19. This is our first of 12 episodes as stated. Each episode will begin with a review of regional and international epidemiology by Professor uh, Dale Fisher, followed by an in-depth talk by our visiting guest uh, expert then a uh, question and answer, uh, which uh, with our guest expert, Professor Fisher and myself as panelists. 
Professor Fisher will re then review key points uh, uh, from the evening, and uh, then we'll close with a review of uh, next week's episode and speaker. Uh, we request that you send your questions, and we welcome your comments of how we can serve you better. To begin the evening, uh, Professor Dale Fisher will be speaking with us. He's a professor of medicine at NUS Young Lu uh, Lin School of Medicine, a senior consultant of the Division of Infectious Disease at National University Hospital, and chair of the Global Outbreak Alert and Response Network hosted by World Health Organization. Professor Fisher. Thanks, David. Yeah, so um, hello to colleagues and friends. I can see already on the, the numbers, there's about uh, about a thousand people uh, uh, online already. So that, that's fantastic. Uh, makes it all worthwhile. Uh, what I'll do each week is uh, is just do some some epi updates, which uh, I think many of you will be familiar with, but, but this is a, a sort of a, a way of being a, a curtain raiser before we uh, switch to the, the main speaker. If, if you look at this uh, slide, what I've done is everyone's familiar, I'm sure, with the, the Johns Hopkins University uh, uh, website. But uh, what I've done is overlap uh, what is basically a, a week apart. So if you look at the dates down the bottom, it's the 1st of April and, and then uh, last night on the, the 8th of April. So you can see the numbers, 883,000 has gone to 1.4 million and the deaths on the other side is 44,000 has gone to 283. And that's really um, sometimes uh, the media con contact me and say, uh, why is it suddenly going so fast? And, and, and I point out as uh, 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 Alan Cheng, I don't know if you're online, but uh, once wisely said the number to go from one to four is the same as, same as to go from 100,000 to 400,000. So, so I think it really does, uh, do does make sense when it's explained that way. You can also look at the countries and and, and US has gone from 189,000 to, to 399. Uh, a lot of this was catch up, but, but, uh, but now it's, uh, it, it's, it's a mixture of catch up, but it's, uh, but it's also probably a, an underestimate now because uh, of an overwhelmed system, uh, especially in New York. Uh, Italy, likewise, 105 to 135 in a week. So probably uh, a fair bit of that is real because, because of the, uh, the, the, the shutdown that's really now been going there for a while. You can see Spain uh, leapt from 102 to 146, and you can go all the way down. China, 82 to uh, 282. So um, uh, a lot of people have asked me, is, is this real? Can it be possible? And, and certainly when you've, when you've been there and, you, and as I saw the, the shutdown, you know, y yes, it's true. There was just, you know, hardly any human interaction. So it's not surprising now after... Uh, 11 weeks of that, that, that they've basically shut it down. They, they know it hasn't gone away, but, but they're, they're well equipped uh, going forward. Um, the next slide is, uh, is a nice epi curve by, by WHO regions. And you can see this uh, characteristic uh, um, curve at the front, which uh, represents uh, China with this uh, interesting little reporting anomaly in the middle. But uh, but nonetheless, you, you can see the numbers and how they've been dwarfed now by, by what's happening, uh, the, br the brown being Europe and, and the yellow being the Americas. Uh, just over the last few days, they've put this black line on, which, which represents the deaths. And as, as you'd expect, by and large, goes hand in hand with, with the epidemiology. But there's some interesting little uh, anomalies on, on this one. As you, again, as you look by, by African, uh, uh, by, by WHO region, uh, you can see the numbers on this side are, are around four or 600 cases. Uh, that's gonna be a combination of under ascertainment, but also Africa probably, you know, obviously isn't as well connected with the rest of the world. So, so it, there is some degree of, uh, of realness to it. Uh, America doing what, what we know it's doing and uh, uh, the Eastern Mediterranean region, Europe, um, this one represents the, the cruise ship um, and, and interestingly how the cases are diagnosed and you can see really clearly on this how long it takes for, for, for people to die. Um, Ciaro, which represents you know, uh, Indonesia, uh, India, countries like that. So again, not, not so uh, great at the moment. Uh, 
uh, Western Pacific region has got this, this lovely little two humped uh, version. This first hump is the Korean outbreak. Um, and you can see that the, the death rate probably didn't really go up much in, in that. Uh, and that's because there were so many young people uh, involved in that outbreak. So, so just a, a couple of, uh, of anomalies there. Um, China up here, again, you can see how you've got the cases, but this long lag for the deaths um, and how they've, they've actually had very, they've had more deaths than cases for, for some weeks now. Uh, this is the, the famous curve we're all trying to flatten. Um, I just want to point out uh, a few countries, you know, the, the United States trajectory, the blue ones being the European trajectory, China, how it had these, uh, you know, this terrible problems with, with Wuhan, but with the shutdown really created a, a flat curve. South Korea did it without a shutdown, uh, but obviously had, had their serious outbreak early on. Um, and, and then there's a mixture of other countries. Japan uh, is, is one to watch. Um, I don't think uh, their interventions are as strong as they could be, but their curve is relatively flat, but, uh, but I think that, that might take off. Taiwan and Vietnam, are, people talk about Singapore being the, uh, the, the poster child, but uh, I think Taiwan and, and Vietnam are really uh, up there. I'll come back to Vietnam later to, uh, uh, to talk about uh, why they might be doing so well. In, in Singapore, just to summarize, rather than show a whole lot of epi curves, we've now got, got quite few imported cases, obviously, same as everyone with all the, the shutdowns, uh, and uh, sorry, the border restrictions. Um, we've got, as of uh, yesterday, we've got 25 active clusters going on, and this is why we've had to uh, do more of the social restrictions. It's in construction sites. Uh, Mustafa is a, is a, a big, um, department store where, where there's a lot of cases and, and that, that provoked a, a, a basically a, a, a shutdown of that and, and all the other efforts in Singapore. The dormitories are a big concern. When I wrote these slides yesterday, there were four, now there's five. Um, and th these dormitories contain thousands of foreign workers. I was at one this afternoon. Uh, the one that says 18 here, uh, that's now 29. Um, that particular dormitory has got 25,000 uh, people in it in, a, in, in 10 blocks. Uh, and the, the, this is going to really kick uh, Singapore's numbers along over the, next, uh, over the next week or two. So that and the fact that 41% of the cases yesterday when we had 172, 41% are actually unlinked at this stage. They're pending investigation. They often get linked, but, uh, but really it's... Uh, it's very easy to see why Singapore said, you know, even though we're only in the, the 100 cases a day category, uh, it, it's time to really impose some social restrictions. So, so that's all I wanted to say about the, the epide epidemiology side today, David. So back to you. Appreciate it, Dale. Um, I want to remind our audience uh, to send your questions in via the Q&A function um, on your uh, Zoom. Uh, so that we can uh, try to get to those during the uh, question and answer period, the panelist period. We'll be seeing Dr. Uh, Professor Fisher again uh, during the uh, panel uh, panelist, along with uh, Professor Tambaya and myself. Uh, leads me to uh, have the privilege of introducing Professor Paul Anant Tambaya, who will be uh, speaking to us this evening. Uh, he's a professor of medicine at National University of Singapore, uh, Young Lu Lin School of Medicine. He's a senior consultant in the Division of Infectious Disease at National University Hospital, and he's president of the Asia Pacific uh, Society of Clinical Microbiology and Infection. Uh, Professor Tambaya is going to speak to us this evening about COVID-19 in Singapore. Professor Tambaya, over to you. Hi, um, thank you very much, and uh, it's a great privilege to be here, and um, uh, it would be nice if I could get my slides up. Okay, thank you. Next slide, please. So again, as you heard the disclaimer, these are my own interpretations of the data and uh, they don't reflect any official view. Next slide. So this is actually the first patient with uh, COVID-19 who arrived in Singapore. And these slides were very kindly um, loaned to me by Dr. Indu, who is a colleague who's now working at Singapore General Hospital so basically, there was a 37-year-old man who had an episode of diarrhea while he was still in China, 
he went to a hospital in Wuhan, was treated with intravenous fluids like everybody else in hospitals in certain parts of the world, and was discharged the same day. Uh, the next day he had a sore throat. He flew into Singapore via Guangzhou. He stayed at the Rasa Sentosa Resort. And then his father got unwell. So he brought his father to the Singapore General Hospital Emergency Department, where he himself was coughing but was not evaluated. And his father was diagnosed on the 23rd of January. Next slide. Interestingly enough, his father had uh, um, been tested for a bunch of respiratory viruses, but was only positive for, uh, at that time, what was known as the novel coronavirus, and cleared the virus very quickly. Um, in terms of the son, the son actually was tested the following day and, and was found to be positive and, and remained positive for the next few days. The family went on to complete their tour in Malaysia. Um, Singapore health authorities alerted the Malaysian authorities and they were quarantined and four others were found positive and treated in uh, Sungai Bulo. Next slide. So again, as you all know, as uh, the whole world knows for, for that matter, um, this was the so-called Wuhan coronavirus that um, appeared in, uh, and it was, the genome was published in early January. And there was a tweet put out by Eddie Holmes from the University of Sydney, where he reported on the uh, Futan University uh, publication of the genome of the coronavirus. Next slide. So again, uh, this is a totally novel coronavirus. It's very closely related to a bat coronavirus. It's a beta coronavirus, which means that it's in the same family as the SARS coronavirus, um, but it is different from SARS uh, virologically and also different from the MERS coronavirus. Next slide. So again, Dale has shown you this graph. So you can see uh, China, um, successive waves, China, uh, Europe, which appears to be plateauing, and then the Americas, which are following on after that. Next slide. So the interesting thing about this virus, um, it appeared at the beginning of December. And uh, if you look at this uh, figure from the article in The Lancet uh, by Professor Chow Bin and colleagues, um, it took about 10 days before it started to take off. And it appeared to take off in some kind of super spreading event that occurred at a seafood market. Next slide. Um, it's interesting that this actually occurred in the city of Wuhan. Now, Wuhan is, uh, is a major city in central China, and uh, it is also the home of the Wuhan Institute of Virology, where they do some really cutting edge work on virology, um, on beta coronaviruses, uh, interestingly enough, and uh, BSL-2 or biosafety level 2 conditions. Next. So that, of course, has raised all kinds of conspiracy theories as to the origin of the virus. But a very distinguished uh, panel of virologists led by Professor Ian Lipkin from Columbia, who incidentally has contracted the coronavirus himself, um, and uh, Eddie Holmes and, and a number of others uh, have published in, in Nature Medicine and Analysis of the Viral Genome, as well as the, the three different possibilities as to how the virus could have uh, originated the first being uh, uh, a single event occurring in an animal, uh, the second, and then spreading among animals, the second uh, from animal to human, and then the mutation occurring in humans, and the third, which is less likely, uh, was through a, a passage in a laboratory, which would have been unusual because there are a number of mutations which would have had to occur. And the bottom line in their conclusion was that although the evidence shows that SARS-CoV-2 is not a purposefully manipulated virus, it is currently impossible to prove or disprove other theories of its origin. Um, next week, you're going to hear from uh, Professor Wang Lin Fa, and he's managed to get hold of some pangolin blood. So he'll be running uh, the serology on the pangolin blood, and maybe we'll have some answers there. Next slide. So again, uh, this has been described as the first social media epidemic, uh, and some early uh, messages on WeChat um, uh, appeared and, um, from China. Um, and this doctor very tragically passed away, an ophthalmologist, uh, Dr. Li Wenliang, um, and he highlighted this uh, condition at the end of December. Uh, following the, um, the tweets, on, or rather the messages on WeChat, which went uh, viral, um, the authorities announced this at the end of December. Next slide. So the, uh, uh, a lot of publications appeared. Uh, a publication appeared in The Lancet, 
um, where they pointed out that uh, by the time uh, uh, the first uh, 100 cases appeared, uh, half of them um, did not have an exposure to the market. And, and the mortality at that time was 11%, um, which is actually pretty high for, for a viral disease and has not been seen uh, since then. Interestingly enough, 80% of them had fever, which means that 20% of them did not. Next slide. So there was this massive publication of 72,000 cases from the Chinese CDC. And what is interesting about this publication, though, um, is the fact that they had 72,000 cases, but 42,000 of them were classified as confirmed based on PCR diagnosis, 16,000 based on symptoms and exposure without any PCR testing, uh, 10,000 were classified on the basis of CT scans, and, and there were a few thousand which were asymptomatic. So that's been one of the issues is that the case definition keeps changing, uh, and it's not just in China, but in other countries as well. Next slide. So, but I think the, the findings can be uh, applied, and, and the findings from this huge study from China actually apply to almost every other setting as well. The age distribution reflected the age distribution in the population with a significant underrepresentation of uh, young children. 80% uh, of cases were mild, 15% of them were severe, and 5% of them were critical, which they took to mean uh, requiring intubation and mechanical ventilation. The case fatality rate overall was 2.3%. Um, 1,700 of the 44,000 confirmed cases were actually healthcare workers. Next slide. So the vast majority of cases, and this is something that is not widely recognized, were actually mild, 80% in this case. Um, and this is an illustration, another case that we actually looked after. This was a young woman um, who felt ill uh, 4th and 5th of February. She had had a Chinese New Year dinner with her cousin who was well at the time, uh, about a week before that. Uh, she saw her general practitioner. She was given clarithromycin. Um, she developed some mild shortness of breath on the weekend. She saw another general practitioner uh, who suggested she go to the emergency department. She was seen and discharged. She was on leave. She took the day off. And then finally, she came back. She was trying to go back to work in the occupational health center for a swab, which turned out to be PCR positive. By that time, she was completely asymptomatic. She had no breathlessness, no cough, no sore throat, no nothing at all. Uh, unfortunately, because she was PCR positive, she was hospitalized. And she remained positive for, for about eight days with one negative in between before she finally had two negatives and was discharged. Next slide. So, you know, as mentioned earlier, the symptoms are pretty nonspecific. They look like anybody else with the flu or upper respiratory infection, just some cough, some sore throats, uh, not very much in terms of running nose. Uh, you get breathless if you're amongst those with so slightly more severe disease, and of course, fever in eight out of 10 cases. So um, colleagues from the National Center for Infectious Disease did uh, a number of multivariable models to look at what would predict uh, um, COVID disease amongst people presenting to their uh, screening center. And this was an analysis of several hundred patients who showed up at the screening center. And basically what it showed was if you had a high temperature, you're more likely um, to have COVID-19 disease than some other viral infection. If you had no sputum production, um, if you had gastrointestinal symptoms, if you had an abnormal chest x-ray, um, if you had, interestingly enough, normal neutrophil or eosinophil counts, then you are less likely to have maybe bacterial pneumonia or an allergic kind of presentation. So it's really hard to tell, you know, who has COVID-19 disease or not based on the symptoms. Next slide. Now, this is an interesting thing which has just popped up. Uh, is the idea that the, the loss of the sense of smell is a sign of trouble. And this is one of the patients at Singapore General who uh, reported this to the Straits Times where he talked about, he was actually an NUS uh, a junk staff, uh, and he felt that that was the first sign of trouble for him. Uh, we've done a small study just doing some screening amongst our patients, and, and it looks like more than half of them, but not all of them, have a loss of their sense of smell. Uh, we're looking at that in a bit more detail from a clinical point of view. And there is actually a biological basis for this. Um, again, as uh, those of you who are clinicians will know that the nose has got a respiratory epithelium as well as an olfactory epithelium, which is responsible for the sense of smell at the top part of the nose. And this olfactory epithelium actually has got cells which express the, SARS re uh, the ACE receptor. And the ACE receptor is the receptor for the virus. Uh, 
So in other words, you know, the virus is floating around, it comes in on a droplet, it has to get into the cells, otherwise we'll just sneeze it out or it'll just go right through us. And it happens that the cells in the olfactory epithelium do have this receptor. So it is possible that that's how the virus gets in, damages the sense of smell early, and maybe that's how it starts getting, uh, getting, a, getting a head start into the body. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, somebody gave my wife a, a sachet of lavender. So uh, I put it on my door and that's my SARS, uh, SARS-CoV-2 detection kit. And I tell myself and I told my wife, once you can't smell that, then it's time to go to the emergency department and get screened. I'm sure it's got no validity. Next slide. So the, as I mentioned here, the, we have this, what they call the surveillance pyramid, where you've got uh, fatal cases, which appear on the top. You've got severe cases, which come to hospital or end up in intensive care. But the vast majority of cases with this disease, as with most other diseases, are mild or asymptomatic. And these individuals do not seek health care. Many of them do not receive a diagnosis but they have the risk of spreading the disease. And this is the concern. Next slide. So um, there was a natural opportunity to study this. Um, again, as you know, many countries evacuated their nationals from uh, Wuhan. And uh, uh, what happened was uh, uh, a group from the National Center of Infectious Diseases screened uh, 94 individuals who boarded the evacuation flight from Wuhan to Singapore. They found two with fever who were tested positive for SARS-CoV-2, and uh, they screened them repeatedly and found one more asymptomatic individual who tested positive and one with an indeterminate result, giving an overall figure of about 3%, 3 to 4%. Um, they did the second flight that came back and they got again a very similar figure. So that suggests that these individuals who were afebrile at the time they boarded the flight um, uh, about 3% of the population had uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2. And I think that's in line with the uh, influenza-like surveillance that came out of Wuhan around the same time. Next slide. So what about Singapore? So in Singapore, um, the people from the Ministry of Health uh, published their data on the first 100 patients uh, who were confirmed with COVID-19 disease in Singapore to be confirmed. You have to have either a positive neutralization antibody test or a positive PCR test. And, um, and about half of them were detected through contact tracing. Uh, some of them were detected through enhanced pneumonia surveillance. A significant number of them, about 10% of them, were actually picked up through alert clinicians uh, who just felt that there was something wrong about these patients and, and they managed to make the diagnosis. What is striking is that we do have routine influenza-like illness surveillance and none of those cases turned out to be positive at that point in time. This is around February. Next slide. So influenza-like illness surveillance is something that countries all over the world do. And the WHO coordinates this using the GIS-RS system. So there are national influenza centers all over the world and they send isolates to the influenza coordinating centers uh, located in multiple locations, including Melbourne, London, uh, and the United States. Um, and the WHO has reported that some of these countries have um, identified coronavirus amongst their surveillance screens for influenza, but we haven't seen any published uh, data there. Uh, next slide. So the virus gets into the individual. Uh, we don't know whether it gets in through the olfactory epithelium or there's actually other uh, portals of entry, but it does get in and it replicates. And the interesting thing about this virus is that the peak viral load appears to be at the onset of disease. And we've seen this with uh, nasal swabs and throat swabs. And this is a study done from China uh, where they looked at the decay of viral load over a period of time. Next slide. And the same was true in data from Singapore in a group from the National Center for Infectious Disease, where again, uh, it's a very busy slide, but you can see the overall trend is going downward. Uh, individuals who were positive had very high viral loads at the beginning of the illness. And then as they got sicker, or as they got hospitalized, the viral loads tended to drop. Next. Now this is very different from SARS because with SARS, the viral load tended to peak when individuals were very ill, when they were hospitalized or they deteriorated and ended up in ICU. And that is the reason why there's such a difference in the epidemiology between SARS and COVID-19 because COVID-19 appears to be more um, contagious prior to the uh, hospitalization, whereas SARS was primarily a healthcare-associated disease. Next slide. 
So um, again, this is data from China, from Wuhan itself, where they showed that the virus uh, titers did not appear to correlate with severity of disease. They also showed that over a period of time, the uh, antibodies started appearing. Uh, IgM appeared initially, followed by IgG. Next slide. Um, recently, there's been a preprint from Germany, from Christian Drosten's group, uh, where again, they showed it takes about five to 10 days before the IgG and IgM start going up using the uh, plaque reduction neutralization titer as a gold standard. Next slide. So the concern though, is that some patients shed virus for a very long time. And again, this was reported in CID by a group from the National Center for Infectious Diseases. And some individuals, they don't turn positive until later on. And that's partly related to sampling and also partly related to limitations of the PCR-based test, where they had an individual who only turned positive on the fifth re repeated swab. So once again, it boils down to being an alert clinician, be a good doctor or nurse, and that's a good way to uh, identify the disease. Next slide. So even if individuals shed virus for a long time, the question always comes up is, are these uh, individuals uh, infectious? And again, going back to the paper from Christian Drosten's group, you can see that individuals are PCR positive in throat and nasopharyngeal samples for up to two to three weeks after the onset of disease and for stool for even longer. However, when they did cultures, what they found was that uh, the cultures were, were not positive at all after day eight. So in other words, eight days after the onset of symptoms, there was nobody in this cohort who had a positive stool culture. Again, this is a relatively, uh, sorry, a positive uh, viral culture from either stool or a nasopharyngeal sample. Uh, this is a relatively small cohort, so we don't know whether this applies uh, across the board. Uh, next, please. So we have found the same thing in that we've had individuals who've had uh, respiratory samples which are negative. This is an individual, I just saw her in clinic this morning. Um, she was a close contact of a singing group of people who were infected with the coronavirus. And she presented with actually uh, diarrhea. She had minimal or no respiratory symptoms at all. She had fever and she had uh, five negative respiratory swabs. But because of her close contact, the consultant in charge of her uh, did a stool culture and also did a, a CT scan, uh, both of which the CT scan was very suggestive of coronavirus disease and the school, the school PCR eventually turned out positive. So, um, so she was diagnosed, she was monitored, and she did fine. Next slide. So there are many options available in terms of diagnosis of coronavirus disease. And if you go to Singapore's HSA's website, you'll find a list of uh, diagnostic tests which they have pre-authorized via provisional authorization. Some of these are locally made, some of these are international, and they have a number of distributors who, again, you can look up on the website. The majority of them are PCR or nucleic acid-based tests. Some of them are, are serology tests. And what I know is that the private hospital down the road has already started opening up uh, serological tests. But I must caution you that serological testing is not useful in the acute diagnosis of the illness. It's useful maybe somebody who's been ill for five or 10 days, and you want to know whether they are uh, they had the disease or not. Next slide. There is, however, an urgent need for a rapid accurate test. And this was the headline last night where we had a record 142 new cases in Singapore and a very tragic case of a young man who was 32 years old, went to the screening center, um, had a swab taken, went home, and he died while awaiting the test result. Um, the goal, obviously, is to have an urgent, accurate, rapid diagnostic test. You know, when I talk to people who are developing tests, I always tell them the gold standard is a, is a pregnancy test. You can go to a convenience store, you pee on a strip of paper, and you get a result which is 99.99% accurate. Um, and we're still not there yet, but uh, I'm encouraged that a lot of people working on this. Next slide. So what happens to people who have died? And we still don't know what's the cause of death of this poor unfortunate young man. Uh, it was sudden death, so we don't know whether it was uh, pulmonary embolism. But there is uh, at least one post-mortem which has been published, and it shows an intense uh, pulmonary inflammatory infiltrate. Next slide. Um, the group from Duke NUS, uh, led by Professor Wang Lin Fa and his colleagues, um, have actually shown that there's um, immunopathogenesis because uh, various elements in the uh, um, uh, 
the innate immune system uh, together with IL-6 uh, and some of the other interleukins are activated in individuals with more severe disease compared with those with uh, less severe disease. Next slide. So moving on, this is another patient of ours, a 45-year-old man who had a remote history of papillary carcinoma of the thyroid, came to the emergency department with fever, upper respiratory symptoms. He worked in a church. Uh, his initial chest x-ray was uh, pretty unremarkable. There was some uh, uh, haziness. Uh, his labs were pretty normal. Next slide. Uh, he represented to the emergency department. Uh, by this time, his x-ray changes had progressed. He was admitted to an isolation ward. He was found to be positive for the SARS-CoV-2. He developed mild dyspnea. Um, and so he eventually agreed to be treated with lopinavir, ritonavir. He got better really quickly, probably way too fast for the lopinavir, ritonavir to have worked because I think it was like the same day that we started the drug. Um, and he was eventually discharged about two weeks later when he had two negative swabs. Next slide. So this brings us to the question of treatment. And uh, the Singapore treatment guidelines have recently been circulated amongst local infectious disease physicians. Um, they reviewed many of the treatment options which are available and which have been used in practice. But the bottom line, however, is that without randomized control trials, determining the efficacy of treatments is difficult due to patient and treatment variability. And so we really do need to see the results of the RCTs which are coming out in the next few days and weeks. Next slide. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin, uh, and this came out from a paper which was published as a preprint in uh, Antimicrobial Agents, the International Journal of Antimicrobial Agents. It's a very unusual paper because the controls were individuals who, who didn't take the hydroxychloroquine. And then in the analysis, they removed six patients from the hydroxychloroquine arm um, because of what they called early cessation of treatment, three of whom were transferred to intensive care and one of whom died. So to me, that's a rather unusual way of doing an analysis. Um, they have a larger cohort, um, which is, uh, has been published as a preprint, and uh, we'll see the comments that come out from there. I personally am a bit skeptical about that. Next. So lopinavir ritonavir has been the subject of a randomized control trial, again led by Dr. Chaubin, and it appears to have a marginal benefit re re uh, in re resulting in a time to clinical improvement improving by about one day. Next slide. That is, however, about the same as oseltamivir, which uh, is used for influenza and has been stocked up in the millions by countries all across the world. Next slide. So uh, Kalitra or lopinavir ritonavir has been widely used in Singapore, and this is data from NCID in the JAMA paper that they published where they showed that there were variable results. However, the drug has got its risks, and this is a message I got from a patient's wife. She said that uh, her husband took the drug and then had really uncontrollable diarrhea, which really got him really down. Next slide. So I think, as I mentioned, we really need to get the results of clinical trials. The WHO has launched the Solidarity Clinical Trial um, which is really easy to enroll. It's got participants in 70 countries. You can just go on the website. And basically, um, if the patient consents, they'll be randomized either to the local standard of care or local standard of care plus one of the following, remdesivir, chloroquine, lopinavir, ritonavir, or lopinavir, ritonavir, plus interferon beta. Next slide. Ultimately, though, I think the critical thing is looking after the patient well. Uh, and these are guidelines from the Asian ICU group, which have recently been published in Lancet Respiratory Medicine, led by a colleague of mine, Dr. Jason Poir. And basically, it's good management of ARDS. Uh, what we do here is we um, bring the patients down to the ICU early if they need more than four liters of oxygen so that we don't have to scramble and do an intubation in the ward and put healthcare workers at risk. Next slide. Vaccine. Now, everyone's talking about vaccine, but in reality, I think it's going to be way too uh, far away. Uh, I, I've been through SARS, and I know that there was a lot of excitement about a SARS vaccine, but when the virus disappeared, the vaccine funding also dried up. Next slide. So SARS uh, spread globally. Again, you all know it started in the Metropole Hotel, uh, where an individual from China appeared and stayed in room 911, and other individuals on the ninth floor got infected and they took the virus to Canada, to Ireland, the United States, to Singapore, Vietnam, and other parts of Hong Kong. Um, I was recently invited to the Chinese University of Hong Kong and uh, they offered me a chance to stay at the hotel. 
um, the ninth floor is kind of uh, hard to get to. But the amazing thing on the elevator, if you can see that, is there's a film on the elevator buttons or the lift buttons. And it says this film is cleaned and sanitized every hour. And that's true because every time I got into the lift, I saw an auntie uh, wiping down that, uh, that sheet of uh, film. Next slide. So SARS in Singapore started with a single individual who happened to be what they call a super spreader. And then there were second, third, fourth, and fifth generations all associated with super spreaders, whereas the vast majority of individuals with SARS did not spread the virus to a single person or at most one or two family members. Next slide. Interestingly enough, the same thing is happening with COVID-19. And we know this from the, uh, the Lancet paper published by the Singapore group where they looked at individuals um, with uh, COVID-19 and even before uh, isolation and quarantine, you had very few transmissions associated with the majority of individuals, but you had super spreaders associated with seven, eight, 12, 13 cases. Next slide. So understanding how to prevent um, an infectious disease like uh, COVID disease um, without a vaccine uh, ultimately begins with epidemiology. And, and I would commend this report by the Singapore Ministry of Health where they looked at three uh, clusters of COVID-19 disease. And again, only two individuals were under home quarantine, but uh, through careful contact tracing, uh, identification of cases, um, they managed to essentially close off two of the clusters um, through, and one of them interestingly enough was linked to another through the use of serology. Next slide. Unfortunately, these clusters continue, and this is from the newspapers about two days ago, where you've got a list of clusters which are occurring in Singapore. And I think as Dale mentioned earlier, the vast majority of them are in these migrant worker dormitories, uh, but we still have had clusters amongst, uh, in a wedding venue, uh, amongst uh, um, a couple of preschools, and, and a very concerning one in a senior citizens facility. Amongst the dormitories also, because workers go to different uh, construction sites, uh, we've had uh, movement across these construction sites to various dormitories. And so a number of them have been uh, affected. Next slide. The dormitories themselves are a huge problem because as Dale mentioned, these are intense concentrations of people. We've got 10,000, 5,000, and even up to 25,000 people crowded into a very small area um, this is, they are mandated to have 4.5 square meters per person, but this is actually in practice done through rooms where you've got 15 to 20 people in a room, uh, where they also have toilets and the bathing facilities. They used to do cooking there, but now they're not allowed to do any cooking over there. So when individuals are isolated to their room, they're isolated to a room with 12 to 20 other individuals. Um, and that actually is somewhat suboptimal, but the sheer numbers make it extraordinarily challenging for the public health people. Next slide. So unfortunately, what we are facing with the dormitories is similar to what happened with the Diamond Princess cruise ship. When you quarantine the ship, and what's happened is these uh, dormitories have been gazetted, so nobody can go in or go out, then you're going to have multiple um, uh, transmissions within the facility. We set up uh, screening facilities there. It's a multi-ministry uh, task force. So individuals who are ill are being isolated and treated, but you don't know how many of them are incubating the disease and you won't know until the incubation period is over. And it's gonna take a really long time, just like what happened with the uh, cruise ship. Next slide. And again, these individuals are uh, migrant workers who come to Singapore to make a living. And it's really tragic what's been happening to them. Uh, in one of the first clusters amongst migrant workers, one of the, uh, the workers who was ill in February, um, his wife back home delivered a child, but he didn't even know about it because he hasn't regained his consciousness. Next slide. So why is the virus so difficult to control? And one theory is because of a significant amount of asymptomatic carrier transmission. And this is a report from uh, China, which was viewed with some skepticism, as with a report from Germany, which appeared around the same time. Next slide. However, the Singapore Public Health Authorities have done a very detailed uh, analysis of uh, clusters. And this was again published last week in MMWR, where they have argued that pre-symptomatic transmission, and this is different from asymptomatic. These are not people who will never show symptoms, but these are people who the day before they had symptoms, they are infectious and contagious. And you can see this if you look it up. Next slide. So again, going back to our public health people, 
um, there's been this huge concern about airborne transmission of the virus. And I would ask you to read this uh, article in detail because they describe what happened. And this is based on closed circuit camera uh, findings. They found that individual number five in the cluster occupied the same seat as individuals one and two, but never met those individuals. And this is not just based on somebody's history. It's based on CCTV analysis. Uh, and these were all over the place. So this was a church cluster. There were 227 church members of whom five or six of them were infected. Now, if the disease was airborne, it's just simply not possible that you got 220 individuals who did not get infected because they were breathing the same air supply. But what is striking is how did the virus get from the same seat to individuals who never met each other and, and obviously had no social contact whatsoever. And that remains to be seen. Next slide. So, you know, there's a lot of this miasma theory that somehow the air is dangerous. And, and this is something that was dominated medicine from the days of Hippocrates all the way right up to the time of Louis Pasteur. Next slide. It took an epidemiologist named John Snow to disprove the idea that cholera was caused by bad air through simple epidemiologic work. And we identified the Broad Street pump as a source of contaminated water. Next slide. So what we need to do is really understand this. And a lot of the concern about the aerosol transmission of this virus has come out of this paper, which was written as a letter in the New England Journal of Medicine. And what they did was they looked at the viability of the SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2 in aerosols and on various surfaces. Next slide. But as I tell my students, you always need to read the fine print. So if you read the supplementary appendix, you'll realize that what they did was they used uh, uh, lab strains of virus using, uh, which were cultured, and then they were aerosolized using a three-jet collison nebulizer and fed into a Goldberg drum. Now, if you don't know what a Goldberg drum is, this is a paper published in 1958, uh, funded by the US Navy. And this was an era where everybody was worried about bioweapons. Bio so essentially, this setup was designed to see whether somebody could weaponize a virus. In, in the original paper, they weaponized Klebsiella. Next slide. But if you look at real patients, and this is what our colleagues from the NCID did, was they did air sampling and they could not find any air samples which are positive. They found some, and this was in a negative pressure room though, they found some virus laden droplets that were positive, uh, but they found the virus all over the environment. Next slide. Now, a subsequent paper came out from the University of Nebraska, and this is still in a preprint stage. And this got a lot of airplay because people saw, found uh, virus PCR positivity in the air samples, especially nearer to the patient. Um, but what is striking about this paper is that all the PCR positive samples were not viable. They didn't grow in cultures. Uh, and so there was no cytopathic effect. Next slide. So again, what is striking is those studies were all done at uh, 21, 22 degrees centigrade. Um, the group from Hong Kong has looked at the behavior of this virus at 4 degrees centigrade, where it lasts for 14 days on surfaces, at 22 degrees centigrade, where it lasts for 7 days on surfaces, and at 37 degrees, where it lasts for barely a day, and then it disappears. At 56 degrees centigrade, if you boil your soup, the, the virus is gone. Next slide. So the same group which uh, showed these uh, cool pictures about air droplets coming out when people sp uh, sing or, or talk or cough actually did experiments in Singapore working with influenza. And basically, they could not find, find virus um, landing up on a mannequin directly opposite the uh, individual who was infected. Next slide. So why does this matter? Now, droplet infections conventionally are believed to spread 0 0.9 meters or 3 feet whereas airborne virus can spread in the same air supply. So our emergency department is built by evidence-based guidelines and the beds are 1.1 meters apart. So we had an undiagnosed SARS patient appeared in bed 19. The patient in bed 18 did not get SARS because it's more than 0.9 meters away. But his wife who was standing in between the two beds ended up getting SARS. So that's what a droplet is infection is about. Next slide. So in fact, the group from Changi actually showed that uh, um, using surgical masks alone may have been enough in the case of an intubation of an unsuspected SARS patient. Next slide. But in, uh, and there's also evidence again from uh, Tan Tok Seng or NCID that, uh, that PPE can remain uncontaminated over a period of time. Next slide. So in, 
it, with all this obsession with airborne transmission, it's critically important to remember the role of the environment, the role of the hands of healthcare workers. And this is shown by colleagues at KK Hospital, where you had a little baby who was not going anywhere. Uh, and you found uh, areas in the room which were contaminated heavily, just like in NCID. Next slide. So what we do, though, is we believe that healthcare workers need protection. And I've shown this slide here where we have a healthcare worker from Tan Tok Seng um, uh, wearing an N95 mask to answer a phone. And the question is, why do you need an N95 mask to answer a phone? And the answer is, if a healthcare worker wants to have confidence in the system, they need to be able to be reassured that they have the protection they need or they think they need. Next slide. Of course, uh, you can go overboard. And during SARS, we had mass robbers uh, robbing a bank using N95, but they found it so uncomfortable, the guy had to put it on his head. Next slide. N95 respirators can be hazardous. I really don't like wearing them. They reduce tidal volume and minute ventilation. We've shown this in pregnant healthcare workers. Uh, next slide. They can also cause headaches. And uh, this is actually a very stressful time for healthcare workers, as has been shown by some of our neurologists and psychiatrists. Next slide. Uh, however, the stress, uh, people react to it differently. And some of our young residents, even though they are concerned about it, they find wearing masks bothersome. They do find a great sense of uh, purpose and collegiality. Next slide. So I think evidence does matter. And this is me during the H1N1 2009 uh, uh, pandemic, where I, I believe that the evidence showed that this influenza was a droplet infection. And so I felt that a surgical mask was good enough. Next slide. So in terms of where is this going to lead us, our, our modelers from the School of Public Health have done some models, and the numbers are very sobering. With no interventions at all, they expect to see 270,000 infections if we have an R0 of 1.5, that's a reproduction number, or 1.2 million infections in Singapore. With quarantine, the numbers would drop significantly. With quarantine and school closure, they drop even more. And with workplace distancing, in the best case scenario, there'd be 1,800 cases. Now, we're approaching that number very soon. Next slide. So one of the questions has always been about children. And children seem to have a very low risk of infection. We had a large outbreak in one of the PAP Community Foundation childcare centers, where we had uh, 15 cases out of 25 staff. But amazingly enough, none of the children were, uh, were found to be infected to date. Next slide. So the question is, are children silent vectors? And this is a, a study out of KK where they showed that children, a, a child with a very mild disease, just one little temperature spike, had very high titers of virus and active shedding in the stool as well as in the respiratory uh, samples. Next slide. So in view of that, as Dale has mentioned, Singapore has introduced some extraordinarily drastic measures. They've called it a circuit breaker, which is in effect a, a, a lockdown. Uh, next slide. They passed legislation, which has appeared uh, in the Government Gazette um, as of two days ago, where an individual is not allowed to leave their home under the, uh, except under very specific conditions. If they're an essential service provider, um, if they're, they're going for medical treatment, or they're bringing someone for childcare or, or for law enforcement purposes. And they're not even permitted to permit another individual to enter their home, unless it's for one of those purposes. Next slide. And you know that in Singapore, we take the law seriously. We had an individual who was, this is from the uh, ICA website, uh, who was given a stay at home order and he went to deliver newspapers, presumably because his livelihood depended on it and he was subsequently charged and he faces a fine of up to $10,000 in a jail term. Next slide. So we hope that these measures will, will break the epidemic. You know, there's a lot of talk about flattening the curve, but uh, Dr. Harvey Feinberg, who was the former head of the Institute of Medicine and a friend of Singapore, he actually argued that we should crush the curve. And I like that. I think that's a lot better than flattening the curve, just crushing it. Next slide. But it's going to have to take a combined effort uh, for everyone. There's been a lot of question about whether we still live in a globalized world or, or whether this is the death of globalization. But in reality, what this epidemic is showing up is all the marginalized communities all over the world, not just in Singapore. And ultimately, as someone has said, no one is truly safe until everyone is truly safe. And that's what happens with infectious diseases like this. Thank you. Thank you, Professor uh, Tambaya, for that tour de force. Uh, we appreciate it very much. Uh, let me... Uh, Quickly move over to a uh, question and answer period. We only have time for one or two questions. Uh, and Clarice, do you have a question for us? 
Well, we've had a lot of interesting questions come in over the chat, and while we'd like to answer all of them, we've chosen a few to highlight this evening as we're running a little long. Our first question is, we've seen a lot of comments about the replication of the Singapore approach, in, for, for example, the US, most recently by IHME. Given the stark differences between Singapore and the US on almost every perimeter, how realistic do you think this is? Would you caution the likes of IHME in making statements potentially in the absence of any evidence of scalability? And do you think contact tracing such as in Singapore could be scaled to the US? Dale, would you like to take this question? Uh, yeah, I would actually. Um, it, it's a good question. It's one I've, I've, I've had a few times. Um, the answer is yes and no. It, it, it's um, the concept of, of all those interventions, the you know, early detection, isolation, contact tracing, quarantining. The, the concept has to stay true, but how you're going to do it in, in a different setting is how it gets adapted. Um, what tolerance does the community have to, you know, um, you know privacy intrusions or, 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 or freedom loss by quarantining and isolating? I think these are all uh, things that the world is getting a bit more comfortable with now that they can see the, the consequences of, of, uh, of not sort of containing the virus. But, uh, you know, I, I won't say that what's happening in Singapore can be replicated uh, in other countries necessarily, but the, the principles can be. Great. Thank you so much. Clarice, do we have time for just one more question? And while you're teeing it up, let me just respond to some of the uh, chat questions, which was, is the anosmia uh, or taste uh, problem permanent? The answer is no. Uh, many vi respiratory viral infections do have that component, uh, and uh, like them uh, with uh, SARS-CoV-2, this is tend to, uh, tends to be temporary. Do we have another question? Well, our next question is, what are the takeaways that we can learn from how Vietnam and Taiwan are managing to keep their curves down? Dale? I'm going to talk about Vietnam in the next session, so maybe we could uh, go to another question. Yeah. All right. The next question is, what are the best strategies for combating COVID-19 in developing countries with limited resources? And can you suggest clinical diagnostic criteria that could be applied in these settings, such as rural Africa, where there's very limited access to x-rays and only some access to PCR? Paul, do you, would you like to ch uh, tackle this? Yep. So um, I think that the key is still clinical diagnosis. And uh, even though um, a lot of uh, low and middle income countries have uh, limited resources, but I think this is an opportunity for, um, for the world to step in. Because as I mentioned right at, my end, at the end of my talk, you know, um, nobody is safe until everybody is safe. Um, and we've seen this with the Global Fund for AIDS, TB, and Malaria. Um, how TB PCR is being rolled out across the world. We've got uh, desktop PCR kits which are being used. And, and what's happening is like a leapfrogging. It's like in, in some places where they never had landlines, everybody's using a mobile phone. You know, you go to uh, the mobile phone penetration in Africa is incredible. Um, so, so I think it's just a matter of time. Uh, and what has happened with, uh, with this outbreak, it's highlighted uh, the need for, for really usable uh, point of care PCR kind of diagnostics. Um, Great. And I apologize. I apologize, Pro uh, Professor Tambaya. I'm going to shift us to the next segment as time is short. Thank you very much for your contribution. Uh, the next uh, segment is actually uh, Professor uh, Fisher is going to uh, review some of the key uh, points from this evening and some additional issues. Uh, there is going to be uh, a poll that he will introduce, uh, and uh, uh, Professor Fisher. Okay, so um, yeah, another brief session, which uh, which, if it seems popular, we'll uh, we'll continue with. But uh, we're we're just going to call it talking points. I'm I'm uh, I, I guess lucky to to have contact with a lot of people at uh, uh, in in Geneva and elsewhere in in other WHO regional offices and things. So I was going to call this section uh, what keeps the DG awake at night, but I thought that might be a bit cheeky. But, uh, but now I, I think public wearing of masks is the one that is keeping him awake at night. Um, just talk about public spraying. Uh, 
and a little bit about isolation and quarantine using Vietnam, Vietnam as an example. So, um, you know, th this, this is a debate. I, I'm not going to present all the data, obviously, because we just want to have a, a little chat about it. But um, it is pointed out that the countries that have good control uh, also wear a lot of masks. Now, Sing Singapore is probably the exception there, but certainly when, when I was in China, it was, it was law. If you left your house, you had to wear a mask. So, uh, so there, was, uh, th there was, you know, strict uh, implementation and, and certainly Hong Kong, uh, the images are the same. So some countries where there is good control, you know, it's part of their bundle. We know about pre-symptomatic spread and that that's real. Uh, and, uh, and, and I know it certainly stops you touching your mouth so much. So, so there's some of the, the, the reasons in favour of it. Um, uh, they're difficult to wear though, they, uh, especially if there's improper use. Um, you, you touch it, you play with it. In, in Singapore, when I'm outside, it gets all sweaty. Um, you often see it under the chin or on the forehead. Uh, it can give you a false sense of security and maybe you stop doing the distancing and, and maybe just if we focused on distancing and hand hygiene, that would be a better approach. Um, and, and others would say, look, casual, casual uh, exposure in public, walking down the street and, and you, you're unlikely to, to get this disease, so, so why wear a mask? So, so that brings us to the WHO and, and maybe I might get the, uh, the poll put up at this time just to get um, everyone's opinion. Um, so um, over the, the course of this week, so you've got about a minute to, to make your selection on the poll, but uh, over the course of this week, as you know, there was an apparent backflip. Um, I never really understood it, but, but this was interpreted as a, as a backflip. Um, uh, which, which I didn't think it was a backflip. It was this uh, advisory on the on the sixth a couple of days ago. Uh, they said WHO said they continue to recommend and prioritise the use of masks for for health workers. Fine. WHO recommends the use of medical masks for symptomatic people in the community. Fine. Uh, and also for others if you're caring for someone sick. Good. Uh, the evidence of masks in the public was lacking. But then they did this cryptic line. If countries are considering the use of masks as part of their comprehensive package and control measures, decision makers should consider, uh, you know, why they're doing it, what's the exposure, what's the setting you're advising on it, you know, how feasible is it to do it, and what type of mask are you going to recommend? So, so that was kind of taken as a as an opportunity for countries to to introduce it. So. So, um, of course, this caused a lot of trouble. Suddenly, some of the NGOs, um, IFRC, UNICEF, there was sudden pressure from them from other countries to provide them lots of masks. It was a, a massive distraction for a couple of days. Um, I know some people uh, love the concept of wearing masks in public. Others, and I'll declare, declare myself, I'm, I'm not in favour of it. Um, but uh, that's that's what I wanted to say about masks. So maybe let's let's close the uh, close the poll now, and we'll get the results of those shortly. The next thing I wanted to talk about was this business, which just because I find it um, sad, um, rows of people wearing uh, wearing PPE, spraying presumably various concentrations of of chlorine on the ground, and it's like this ritual of uh, of going along spraying the ground but what what gets even worse is when you see people uh, you know people getting sprayed so you know which is clearly just wrong the uh, and this happens a lot in indonesia so so i i hope somehow we can get this curbed again some of the ngos are very concerned about this this practice that's growing of spraying people so that that that's another talking point now just to bring to the issue um Vietnam. I got these uh, slides from Sharon Salmon. Thank you. So they're not my slides. I'll I'll try and interpret them as best I can. Sharon's up in in Wipro, uh, and and people wonder why Vietnam's going well. Is it under ascertainment? Uh, and this would suggest that it's not. Um, you know, you can see for just 240 cases, they've done 75,000 tests. So so that's uh, that's very impressive. That uh, that percentage positive rate. And, and look at how much uh, look at how much of the uh, contacts that they've, they've determined. You know, like I think if my maths is right, it's about 
for every confirmed case, they've got about 300 contact, contacts of, of varying, uh, varying intensity, I guess. Um, so to look at their epi curve, you can see that's fairly flat. You've got the blue ones, which are the imported ones. So like most countries, they're, they're coming down. Uh, red ones are locally transmitted and they, these, these look like lots of, lots of clusters. I know they've had some healthcare clusters because the, the hospitals are obviously very overcrowded. Um, the, uh, but, but some of their principles, you know, which are, as we said before, these are the outbreak response principles, you know, after prevention, early detection, isolation of positive cases, quarantine of your, um, of your close contacts, uh, good co case management and um, stamping out the outbreak. There you go. So, um, but, uh, and, and these are some of, the, some of the ways they do it and under, underlying all this is, is a risk communication strategy. So here's a little bit more on their quarantine approach. So quarantine and treatment at the healthcare facility for cases. So obviously uh, that's got a limit and when you're at 240, then I guess it's, uh, it's still possible, but, uh, but there'll be a need to, and I would presume there's, a, there's a, a ramp up approach where there's community isolation facilities. Uh, but they also seem to admit healthcare facilities for, uh, uh, sorry, the close contacts also go into the healthcare facility. Then they've got these different levels of quarantine. So close contacts of, uh, so there's a centralized quarantine for close contacts and household members as well. And, and there's, there's even a, a home or self quarantine for, for contacts of those being quarantined. So they're, they're actually uh, asking contacts of contacts to, to go into to, to quarantine. And then they've got the concept if there's a, a community, then then you can you can ring fence that off, uh, and that that needs a, a sort of a national approach. So, so so this is um, yeah. So this is um, I guess many could say it's over the top or it's not feasible, but you know this is how you get a flat curve, I guess. And and I think uh, every country, like I've said earlier, is is running its own outbreak. Uh, its own interventions, and, and some will work in some contexts, and you have to adapt in in different countries. But uh, anyway, this is how Vietnam's doing it, and and it seems to be working. Um, I always finish sentences like that, working so far, um, and uh, and and I think that helps uh, explain. It's just those standard interventions of the testing and the isolation and the quarantine and the all these efforts that, that seem to be doing it and, and they've got a, a system to do it. One, I've added on uh, one slide here, which uh, when I was out at the, the dormitories today, th this, uh, this came up because we were asked to go out and organize a swabbing team. And, and a colleague of, of mine who was, was leading this uh, operation um, said, but it's not just about swabbing. Um, you know, we've got to get some community, <clears throat> some communications in and if we're and if we're confining people to their dormitory we've got to make sure they've got food and and uh, yeah you know we've got to you know get all the results back and we've got to communicate it and and, and I thought uh, I, I would share this slide with him and, and for those of of you out there that haven't done a lot of outbreaks this is a this is a typical uh, matrix that from a very old go on slide um, which uh, which really shows how you tie it all together and and uh, when, you, when you're running an outbreak. And in this instance, in the dormitories, we're running an outbreak within our outbreak. So, so I'll leave those, those thoughts with you. Um, and uh, back to you, David. Great. Thank you so much, Dale. Could we see the results of the poll, please? Well, we're pulling those up. Uh, so that's our audience's opinion. Any comments? I think we've already had our comments on that. Well, that leaves me, to, we're, time is short uh, and we've run over a bit and I, we do appreciate the uh, audiences uh, continuing to stay with us. Uh, it's my uh, task now to uh, thank uh, Professor Tambaya for being our guest this evening and uh, to, to mention that next week's speaker is Professor Wang Lingfa, who's professor, in, uh, excuse me, professor and director of program uh, in emerging infectious disease at the Duke uh, National University of Singapore Medical School in Singapore. His topic will be COVID-19 from bats 
Pangolin to Coronavirus and Serology. So until next week, stay safe, wash your hands, and as the song title goes, don't stand so close to me. Good night. Thank you.